the last time we left off talking about blockchain? And so, what are the implications of it? Well, in terms of speed, uh, it can be slow at times because you have all this uh, uh, security and everything else that you need to compute and get past in order to use it. Uh, it requires a lot of authentication. And so, therefore, that's why it's considered to be unhackable and that's it's safe and private. And since you have no central authority, like for example, your money in your bank, you are pretty much relying on who's ever in charge of that bank is gonna be honest with you. What's to prevent a bank from just hitting a button and wiping out your entire account? And they can wipe it from their entire database and what are you gonna do? You no longer exist. On the other hand, uh, in blockchain, you've got millions of ledgers and uh, transactions. So, blockchain is so great. Why doesn't everybody get into blockchain? Well, no. The, the thing about technology is there's always a price. And the question is, is the price lower than what you're getting out of it? Technology is all about ROI. It's about what am I going to get back? And so, you're going to need special coding. You need people who understand how to do blockchain coding. You run the risk of subversive organizations that What's to prevent criminals from using blockchain so they could talk to each other or terrorists? Uh, one thing uh, Dr. Cho has joked about is I'm going to start the antisocial network. And that's that we're going to have software that will erase every last piece of you digitally. So if you bring up my picture, all you're going to see is a bunch of pixels. Problem is, is that the moment I create that software, every terrorist on the planet is going to want to get his hands on it. So, yeah may not be that great an idea. Blockchain is uh, integrated. And being integrated, it's susceptible to being uh, hacked, especially the smaller chains. If I see that I have a smaller chain, then I can just go after the whole thing. Um, again, it could take a lot of time. And also, here's the biggest problem of all. Because of the computing power, uh, that this requires that so basically I'm solving a problem that has a one in a trillion chance of being solved every time. Uh, it uses a lot of power. And so all the power of Bitcoin uses in a year is equal to the power that's used in all of Denmark in a year. Now, this doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. And the cost per power keeps going down per bit. And so that's what you're hoping it will get uh, good enough. But you know how trickle down kind of works. Uh -huh. But there are certain applications, yeah, I'll pay for the power. Uh -huh. But not everything can become Bitcoin, otherwise you know, all systems would collapse. And so some of the applications is in banking. Actually, 10 minutes in banking is fast. And that's that if you want to make an overseas transaction, what do you do? You always have to wait hours or 24 hours for authentication. Now authentication can be done right away because you're peer-to-peer. You're not beholden to a bank or national laws. Uh, it could be used for health care, for records, uh, government records. Doing it by hand is very expensive. Why not just do it in a block? And for supply chain, a lot of companies are implementing blockchain. So they have full traceability. They won't lose their records. Now, since blockchain removes a middleman and brings everybody together, What's possible disruption? Why not blockchain Uber or Airbnb? Everybody who wants to sign up, let's form a block. Why do we need those guys? Why are we paying for the middlemen? Smart contracts are a big are a big thing right now, and especially with regards to things like shipping things overseas. Real estate is a good area to remove middlemen. And what about used goods, the eBay's and stuff like that? Why not just do it yourself? Cybersecurity, so we talk about Trojans, viruses, and worms. And so what we have are firewalls, monitoring agents. Those are the things that try to catch things. Uh, event managers, things that notice that this event doesn't quite fit in. And also client managers, which is directly related to the users. And so what do you do? You do file sharing, collaboration, and email between computers. And so... Uh, this is what cybersecurity has to cover. 
uh, zero trust networks are trending. And that's, uh, it takes a lot of infrastructure, tone IT, and people make mistakes. Uh, what took down? <laughs> uh, the government was actually a thumb drive. Somebody just picked up a thumb drive, put it into a computer, and then uh, the government got hit by a worm. And it took 14 months to contain that virus. And so this is why actually ASU's policy is if you find a U USB stick, throw it away. Don't touch it because it could be contaminated. Uh -huh. In terms of value added, the thing about security is it's one of those things that doesn't make you more productive or something. It's just one of those things that you need that's required but doesn't necessarily have a lot of value to it. And so... One of the ways to do security right now, which a lot of people are doing, is just go to the cloud. And even the government uh, uh, has shifted a lot of its security to the cloud. And the reason why is uh, when you inquire into the cloud, it just authenticates who you are and then accepts your request. So what information are you giving the cloud? Well, maybe your username, your password. That information is up for grabs. Once you get up into the cloud, you can imagine that it's just being a place with trillions of random little rooms. It's like nobody knows where to look uh, once you're in. Uh, and every time you go into a room, what does it do? It authenticates back to you. Uh, does cybersecurity make money? Well, you want to pay for a quality system, or do we just take it all for granted? And so companies will pay for it because uh, we have $5.3 trillion in private sector value. One bill worm can end all that. Uh, silicon technology. The way silicon technology works is it's a semiconductor. And the idea of a semiconductor is sometimes I'm moving current, which are electrons, and sometimes I'm not. So I can turn it on and off, and that makes a gate that gives me my one and zero, whether I'm on and off, and then my digital logic. Uh, or binary logic creates my entire computing system. And so uh, the way they do it is silicon. Uh, for those of you who remember chemistry, you need eight electrons on the outside shell for stability. It has four. Well, materials like phosphorus have five. So once they bond to everything else, they got a free electron hanging around. Uh, the foundation of the semiconductor has pretty much driven everything. It's driven computing, the internet, everything. Because the semiconductor got better, that's why all these systems got better. And so, uh, the issues are, is we still live in a macro world when systems require a lot of energy. And so, bandwidth, speed, all of these things matter. And so, the limited foundation of all these technologies is on the semiconductor. Now, the way a semiconductor works is I talked about how it turns on and off. Well, what turns it on and off is called a gate. And the source of electrons is called a source. And where it goes out is called a drain. And so that distance those electrons have to travel, that's when you hear when they talk about 22 nanometers or something like that. To put it in perspective, your hair is 100,000 nanometers. They're talking about hitting seven and five. The problem is, now you're talking about sizes approaching the size of an atom, so it's hard to turn off, and that's the issue. Um, now, people talk about 7 nanometer. That's actually false. The gates are not 7 nanometers. The things they're using to draw the pictures with is 7 nanometers. Uh -huh. But at 11 nanometers, you're starting to hit the limits of silicon, meaning the stuff will just leak. You can't shut it off. Not only that, it's getting pretty darn expensive. You need some super tools for this. Like a 14 nanometer facility costs $5 billion. Uh, the biggest foundry in the world decided not to go to 14 nanometers. It was too expensive. They quit, they quit at 22. So the bottleneck on all this is all these different technologies. You're just getting too small. And so the big challenge is now that everything's so small, you have to drive all that current into a load. <laughs> and the outside world is much bigger than the internal world. So they've been trying to work on different types of uh, alternative technologies like graphing. The problem is graphing is very fast, but you can't shut it off. Quantum tunneling computing. Uh, 
The idea behind that is that there are multiple states that electrons can exist in. So instead of being 0 and 1, now you could be like 0 to 6 or 0 to 8. Uh, but they require exotic materials, and those exotic materials are expensive. And so what a lot of companies are focusing on is just system design. And how has that been good? Batteries. The batteries only got better by like 10 or 20 percent. But the big change you saw, but then why before were my cell phones three hours and now all of a sudden I can go 12 to 24? It's because of smart systems. Basically, your phone shuts itself down uh, anytime you're not using something to save power, and all that power really adds up. Uh, the thing is, there's nothing on the horizon right now for computing. And so, silicon took 30 years, and OLED, those bright displays, took 25 years. When they first came out, my boss said, should we worry about this? I said, no, it's going to take at least 10 years. And as it turns out, it took OLED 25 years. Uh, so, the thing about all these technologies we're looking at, what's the implication? Well, technologies die. Industries can die. The thing is... It's so cheap now to implement technology. Are we seeing the end of economies of scale? No. <laughs> they keep saying it, but yeah, it's gotten easier, but still. Uh, there are a lot of savings in volume. So, in, and also the impact of these new businesses. How big are they really? For example, what is the market share of Airbnb? Is it 1.2%, 3.4%, or 10.5%? And as it turns out, Airbnb has 3.4% of the industry. Like they talked about Walmart last year. Walmart grew at a pace of 60% online. Oh, Amazon should be worried about it. Well, Amazon's got 49% of all online sales. They've got the most used search engine in the world, even greater than Google. How many of you, when you buy a product, just go straight to Amazon and just search for it? Yeah, Walmart grew by a lot last year, but they right now have 3% of the market. <laughs> there is magnitude, and then there is percentage change. Yeah, percentage change might look great, but in terms of magnitude, they still got a long way to go uh, to catch up to Amazon. And the thing about Amazon is they're one of the most progressive countries in the world. They get the whole digital thing. I don't know if Walmart ever really will. Uh, that's not their business. And so, that wraps it up, talking about technology.